Thank you. Thank you, Leo. Yeah. Let me start to see that I can share the screen properly. That's a first task. Okay, seems like it works. Um, it, is a, it is a real uh, pleasure uh, uh, to be at the Brown and uh, just uh, deliver some of the interesting uh, ideas and talks. Um, I think, uh, as Leo said, it's only uh, less than an hour drive, in fact, from my place. I think um, when when we scheduled this colloquium, we, we, we about about almost a year ago, I guess that, and then we thought, well, by the time that we set in the, the next spring, we should be able to kind of come to the normal. But uh, unfortunately, that's not the case. But I, I hope that we are very close so, uh, to getting to the normal. So at some point, once things become uh, kind of settled, and uh, we hope to kind of, I, I hope to visit uh, personally back to the, uh, the Brown and, and also kind of meet the old friends and new friends are there too. All right, um, as Leo mentioned that uh, this field of the two-dimensional systems and the heterostructures becomes quite uh, uh, exciting as well as competitive. And I'm going to share some of the idea and uh, my view on there and my interest in there, but certainly there's a strong overlap with the, what the Leo is doing. So I'm going to just uh, kind of promote <laughs> the field for the Leo at the Brown. So I do start with uh, basically this, uh, the uh, controlling the materials in the two dimension. And it had, uh, this idea has been around for uh, some years. Uh, in fact, in the semiconductor heterostructures using the uh, molecular beam epitaxy or the, uh, the uh, molecular, uh, the, uh, the metal organic uh, chemical vapor depositions. And there are many that put, uh, the tools that uh, in principle, we can just can create this uh, semiconductor heterostructures almost atomic by uh, atomic layer fashions. Um, and this type of the uh, wafer scale of the um, uh, MB on the film, for example, has been important tool for uh, physics research as well as even just a technological tool at this point, right? Um, so th it's amazing to see that how this uh, technique has been developed in such a way that now you can really control the almost kind of layer by layer structures in the wafer scale. Uh, without too much of defects in there. And uh, in the best case, the electron can move from one side of the wafer to the other side yeah, without any single uh, scattering event in the really high quality gallium arsenide uh, uh, semiconductor structure, structures. I would say this is one of the uh, uh, really big achievement of the humankind, um, such a the clean control of the materials. And of course, that allows us a, a lot of exciting physics in the field in the past probably 20 or 30 years. Uh, all this uh, quantum artifact, the fractional quantum artifact, many things re related with the mesoscopic physics and quantum devices. Um, a lot of this uh, quantum engineering and science actually rely on the availability of this, uh, the, our control, we humans control of this uh, the material structures, almost atomic layer by layer in the larger length scale. So while that uh, this is one of the model that by stacking the material by layer by layer, one can achieve the very interesting system. Um, about say 15 years ago or so, uh, there is this kind of new type of this, uh, the material systems start available. And starting from the graphene um, in 2004, that Andre Geim and Kostel Novoselov announced that they can extract the one single atomic sheet of the graphene uh, uh, out of graphite crystals. And the field decided out, again, rapidly revolved that try to understand that uh, this material is extremely confined form. In some sense, the thinnest material you can get um, with in the chemically stable form. Uh, graphene serve a lot of exciting physics afterward, uh, something that I'm going to share today as well, right? But in some sense, graphene serve also a good starting point. Uh, the community start to look for some other materials very similar but also a different kind. Boron nitride is a good example. It is semi, it is an insulator. Uh, graphene like the structures and uh, within the layer, all the chemical bond is there, but in between the layer, there's a weak bond there force. So like the graphene, you can extract one single layer. And, uh, but unlike the graphene, because of different uh, <clears throat> um, the atomic structures, uh, it is a good insulator or good dielectric. But then one by one, we know that transition metal dye, charcoal dye, even 
just old friends like the high temperature superconductor, like the bismuth strontium collagen copper oxide, or even organic materials, organic, inorganic. The community has have, have been realizing that um, there are class of the van der Waals material, which you, know, you can get the layered structure such that uh, the, you can extract one atomic layer and they can be stabilized even further. The older physics is naturally confined to two dimensions. And furthermore, depends on the host crystals, you can come up with a various different type of the, um, uh, the, the electronics, magnetic, or the chemicals, mechanical properties by your choices. I think this is one of the really exciting part. Uh, beyond the graphene, there are still a lot of different material choices and they can come into the many different type of the flavors that you can play around. Perhaps the one more important part that which is a, a, a kind of most exciting in my opinion is it's not only single material, but you can just stack them together to form again, quasi three-dimensional structures like the MB grown the system I showed you before. In principle, you can just extract one material to another and you just restack them and create the somewhat different functional structures out of it. That's uh, that, uh, basically when a few people studied out this field and realized uh, such a possibility, it was a really exciting moment that this kind of really widely open field in front of us to realize uh, such a diverse system without worrying about the uh, chemical compatibility or that uh, uh, atomic lattice compatibilities by when, when you stack them together uh, to form the heterostructures. structures. It's not only this PowerPoint demonstration. In fact, uh, the past few years, it has been really beautifully demonstrated. And here is a good example that, uh, that my colleague, the Jim Horn and I just worked together uh, when we were both at the Columbia. Uh, demonstration showing here is basically you just grab the uh, graphene and boron nitride and carefully just kind of pick them up and stack them together. You can form these heterostructures by literally stacking atomic layer by layer if you want. Uh, but nevertheless, if you just do it very carefully and unit it uh, carefully, you can make the, those interfacial structures extremely clean and not much of the atomic scale of dirt there. And uh, not only that, because it's a single crystal, so you can cleave and you can start it out. You can just uh, choose your materials, your kind, and carefully stack them. And then when you just etch from the side with the chemical etching, expose, say, graphene edges, there's techniques that develop that you can make the contact onto the side wall of the graphene. And choice of the good chemistry make that this context extremely efficient as well. Right? In the end of the day, you can just get, say, these materials encapsulated with the, the good dielectric and make the good contacts in there. And uh, you just maintain the high quality of the two-dimensional system like the graphene. Turns out you can make the devices such that electron beam free path is extremely long, something like 100 micron length scale that in this type of device with extremely efficient contact. And this type of things is uh, possible. So in terms of material quality, although this one started out only say five years, not more than 10 years ago, uh, the quality of the material you can achieve now in this type of the system, at least the graphene encapsulated boron nitride, almost can catch up that quality of the electronic system you can achieve in the gallium arsenide heterostructures, really low mean pre path of the ten, tens of million um, mobilities, centimeter scale of the four seconds of mobility. So I think that's kind of really exciting. Uh, the achievement that, that happens in this field. And that immediately allows us to kind of build up the many interesting quantum mechanical, uh, quantum devices I just mentioned, right? For example, here's one of the device example. So uh, we just kind of carefully encapsulate the graphene in between the boron nitride right? and put just the top and bottom graphite gates. So you can see that within the stack, everything is van der Waals stacks, like this, uh, the TM images of the uh, semiconductor heterostructures. If you just cut it out, you will see atomic scale of heterostructures that all, everything is controlled, except everything is van der Waals materials, right? And then you can just make the, this careful context and the top and bottom gates and rather complicated gate structures. This type of device has been realized in gallium arsenide heterostructures. Idea here is uh, uh, you just uh, carefully control with the gate, the path of the quantum or edge state such that you can create this, um, uh, the quantum hole interferometry, in other words, the current will carry by this all the edge state and controlling the edge state with uh, this quantum point contact, you can create this, uh, the interference of the electron wave functions carried along this quantum edges. And that is, has been good tools, an important tool 
to understand this breeding statistics, uh, especially if the quantum energy becomes an ionic states. So now with the graphene, with the boron nitrogen structures, so this type of experiment is uh, readily can be done in my group as well as a, a, a few other groups in the world. So I think this is kind of one interesting demonstrations. On the top of that, graphene is uh, not only good system that you can realize the high quality electronic system because it has uh, no energy band or gap there. Uh, the, you can make the, this contact with any of the metals relatively easily. So for example, you can make the superconducting contact on graphene rather easily, or I should say rather easily, but uh, that uh, quite efficient way. Here is a niobium nitride in contact with this uh, graphene. Again, we didn't even quantum or edges. So basically you can make a quantum or system, superconductor coexist and try to proximitize this quantum or edges with the superconductors. And for example, the, uh, sorry, that is somehow low, lower resolutions. Uh, here, the, the uh, fractional quantum or edges basically proximitize a superconductor and there is a, some interesting cross under reflection is happening. And that's kind of another example that I'm just kind of simply just to throw the present example that uh, this type of the device structures, which has been dreamed of in the uh, semiconductors can be done with a very similar quality of the electronic system in the graphene, simply because of this availability of this uh, the particular heterostructures. Now, this type of the idea can push the even just not only one single layer, but many multiple layers. So here is the example that graphene, again, two layer of the graphene with the boron nitride in between. You can make this multiple layer, either, either tunneling layer or direct like the structures. I'm probably going to discuss a little bit on this example uh, in tie with uh, Leo's work, uh, but also similar idea can expand into the not only graphene, but any semiconductor heterostructures, uh, as long as they are van der Waals structures here, the tungsten disilenide, polydisilenide, P and N type semiconductor them together, make the heterostructures, uh, they by just stacking. Perhaps the my group's most difficult experiment we've made ever uh, the, the, in terms of stacks. Here, basically, there are three semiconductor stacks, uh, P and P, and in between there, there's boron nitride, the uh, separation layer with the graphene top and bottom gates. And then again, completely encapsulated, there are about nine or 10 of this van der Waals system. Uh, four or five of them are electrically activated separate contact. You can see that that complications of the devices uh, was uh, it takes a long time. Yield is not necessarily high because everything's that stacked by hand. But nevertheless, the amazing part is the device work and shows that, say, interesting uh, bipolar transistor behavior and something like this, right? The more exciting part is, as I mentioned, that you can jump onto the different type of the system. For example, that uh, you can just stack that. Uh, how about the superconductors? stacked with the, the magnetic system. And this type of the really different heterostructure is one thing that it's a very difficult combining conventional technique, right? For example, the superconductors and the uh, ferromagnetic insulator, how you just put them together. There are a few examples, but you have to really work it out hard with the MB system uh, to make the uh, compatibility. In some sense, in the Van der Waals system, this comes as a free, uh, as long as you know the, how to extract this material and that material is stabilized. Good example in this particular case is a combination of the niobium disilenide and chromium germanium telluride, which is a magnetic system. Uh, again, niobium disilenide. And this chromium germanium telluride is a magnetic insulator. So if you have the very thin magnetic insulator and put them together, basically you have Josephson junctions, the Cooper -Kerr pair can in principle uh, tunnel between them. Uh, but it is a spin polarized the, the, such, such that it can induce some of the phase shift of the tunneling, the Cooper pair across uh, this, uh, uh, the magnetic insulator weak link. So idea here in this device is basically you insert uh, this magnetic insulator only one of the arm and the other arm is basically niobium disinide, niobium disinide with a very uh, weak link in naturally formed in between them. And they actually connected all this from the loop so you can view this is kind of ugly, but still kind of skid loop. And using this skid loop, you can in principle measure what, whether there is any particular phase shift happen for the group of pair tunneling into the, this magnetic uh, the tunneling junction. It turns out this experiment is interesting, but I don't have time to go over detail. But uh, what happened is uh, that this magnetic insulator developed this uh, the magnetic domain structures in low magnetic field. 
that will make the, this, uh, the shift of the, this uh, speed, uh, the phase depends on the, these domain structures. And then you can just kind of uh, the shift around this, uh, the, the uh, speed domains um, by controlling the domain structures with the temperatures or the, the magnetic field sweeping. So the idea here is again, that without detail of the discussion of the physics, I want to kind of present that basically that phase space we can navigate through with the various different combinations is really huge. And uh, ranging from just uh, revisioning some of this, uh, the quantum hole interferometry uh, until the, uh, including this uh, bit more exotic, the, um, the magnetic tunneling Joseph's injunctions, the ranges are kind of really widely distributed. So what I decide today, as a, with this uh, the long introductions, by the way, just to stop me any time and ask any questions, right? I think uh, that uh, the, it's more like I wish to make that bit more informal discussion. So I'm just kind of going over a little faster on this because it's just to show the demonstration. But if you are particularly interested in certain part, I can just stop there and we can make a little bit long discussions, right? Otherwise, I will just run through it. <laughs> okay. So this question I want to kind of discuss a little bit more to dwell on to the bit detail and interesting physics is related with some common phenomena and that can be revisited or the realized uh, in this Van der Waals heterostructures. And that is related with the macroscopic quantum states that can we actually create a somewhat robust or interesting macroscopic quantum states. So I should probably clarify what I mean by the macroscopic quantum states. Everything is in some sense quantum state, but particularly for the condensed matter physicists, Macroscopic quantum state, there are a few examples one can immediately write down. Something like this, superconductivity, Bose-Einstein condensation, superfluidity, and those kinds of things in some sense, you can realize in the a rather collection of the system, in many cases that you want to realize this really fundamental quantum states. Uh, they can be even macroscopic. So in naked eyes, you can see that or just touch them and just manipulate them. Right. I think this, uh, this is kind of exciting part. But as you see here, these are macroscopic, but yet quite robust. Part of the reason that robustness comes from is they are all kind of related with the condensation of some of the boson uh, particle. In fact, uh, this is not the fundamental bosonic particle per se, but these are all the composite bosonic particle condensations. Superconductor, as we know that it's a group of pairs, the condensation of the Cooper pair. And Cooper pair, you can think about is a, a bosonic pair in the momentum space of the electrons, right? The electrons are bosonic pair in the momentum space. And of course, called atoms, uh, it consists of a lot of fermion constituent, but in the end of the day, they all total spin is uh, the integers that are turned as a composite boson. As a composite boson, they can also condensate it when their distance becomes kind of uh, the comparable compared with their thermal lengths. Not to mention of the helium-4 is again that composite bosons made of this, uh, the uh, nucleus and the electrons, but all together they become composite boson for the helium-4 and they just can beautifully condensate into the uh, Bose-Einstein condensations. In this particular case, it turned into superfluidity, right? So as you see here that the robust the macroscopic quantum state can obtain by just condensating this composite boson. And by saying the composite boson mean that we can think about this uh, constituent particle. So in some sense, if I just kind of control the interactions to form this composite boson, there might be that just cases that we can just uh, change the nature of the boson such that, that we can induce the, the Bose-Einstein condensation in somewhat different, uh, different context. For example, we know that the superconductivity is momentum space uh, condensations, meaning that in the real space, it is a rather weakly bound such that momentum uh, space description is better. So in some sense, in boson uh, condensation language, this is a more like the weakly interacting boson condensations. While that uh, superfluid helium, basically this is boson is already tightly bound as atomic form, right? So this is more like the strongly bounded bosons, uh, bosonic condensations. So in some sense, you can see that uh, the superconductivity, which is governed by the uh, bosons, uh, the uh, the uh, Baden Cooper Schrift type of the BCS theory, while that this uh, the typical uh, the bosonic condensation is Bose Einstein condensation, uh, although they are related, basically that's uh, related with this uh, how this composite boson should look like, right? In fact, uh, this has been a really big topic in the um, atomic molecular optics physics community, right? There that you can in principle control the interaction between these uh, two fermions to form the bosons. So, Say, for example, you can think about dimolecular uh, uh, 
di-fermionatonic molecules that form the bosons, the interactions can be controlled by the Feshbach resonance, which can be controlled by the magnetic field. So they can demonstrate it that coming from that strongly bound boson through the weakly bound bosons, and they start to see that indeed their the condensation natures can be controlled from the uh, the bosons and condensations to the BCS type of the uh, condensation by controlling the size of the boson by controlling their the interactions, right? So one of the idea that we had is can we actually realize this in more of the condensed matter system such that we can control this uh, the uh, the boson contents. This idea has been around for a while, and there are many condensed matter systems. In fact, uh, these proposed that realize those composite bosons with the variable the, uh, the size of the boson. One of the, um, the interesting examples that quite early on is uh, uh, just the, the realizing or the using the exciton in the semiconductor. So exciton, uh, which can be formed by the shining the lights on the semiconductor, such that creating the electron hole pairs, uh, basically excited by the light, uh, basically this hole that leave behind of this uh, developed band, the electron in the conduction band, uh, as long as uh, their the Coulomb detection is strong, they tend to form this, uh, the bound state, what you call the exciton. And uh, if you ask uh, what is uh, the quantum statistical nature because it's two fermion bound states, uh, so it is uh, the, the bosonic uh, bound state, right? Of course, exciton is a transient state, but let's say that somehow if you can make that this exciton is extremely long lived, one can imagine that I can just realize some of the quasi equilibrium states of the, this uh, the boson or uh, exciton. And one can just uh, try to draw that the phase diagram of the possible this exotic, uh, the, uh, the condensation state. And here's uh, some of this uh, theoretical uh, cartoon that drawn here that uh, again, the controlling this uh, boson density or exon density, if the exon is uh, sparse, then the distance is farther away compared with exon size. This is more like this uh, tightly bound exon pictures uh, where the condensation is naturally uh, Bose-Einstein condensation pictures. But once you just push into the more of this uh, the tightly uh, spaced exciton, they start to interact very strongly each other. Uh, classically, they can actually melt into the electron hole Fermi liquid uh, because they're, uh, they, they basically, their screenings, uh, the Coulomb detection, basically bosons start, uh, exons start unbound. But nevertheless, both of the this electron for Fermi, uh, the, uh, the plasma, once you cool it down, get degenerated, and considering these interactions between them, they can condense into the boson, uh, the, uh, again, the condensation, the closed uh, BCS type of things. At least the theory tells us that uh, like this uh, AMO cases, uh, the BEC to the BCS is not just a transitions, but crossover. You may expect to see the very similar, the crossover behavior into the dysexonic system. Now, while that this is a very exciting idea, realizing this type of system, as you see here is a cartoon, yeah. And part of the reason is that very important assumption I just throw in there is uh, somewhat difficult to realize. Boson here is a transient particle. And only when they live long enough or forever, I can draw the phase diagram. Otherwise, they will just kind of recombine to the lights and disappear. Right? This is, in the end of the day, excited state, not the ground state. What I mean by the phase diagram or the thermodynamic diagram, right? However, there's a few different rules that one can take. That to realize that this uh, Bose-Einstein condensation of the exon. One way is basically put them into the cavity. And this is basically so-called the exon polariton Bose-Einstein condensation. Once you put in the cavity and they shine the light, for example, that the exciton can start to the interact with this cavity photon and cavity is a high, high Qs there. Then uh, this, uh, the photon and excitons as a combinations can treat like the exciton lifetime or more precisely exciton polariton lifetime uh, forever, as long as the two of the cavities are high. Therefore, the one can drive the condensations. This idea, in fact, isn't pushy. Just get rid of the light and uh, just make the cavity and drive electrically and just raising, uh, lazing the, 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 the cavity and still create this uh, the. Uh, the cavity photon and the exon combinations and create this uh, really coherent source that related with this condensation phase of the exon uh, the polariton. And this can be a really important tool to realize that uh, coherent light source. However, this actually is a good directions, but some of uh, the different directions that what I just mentioned here, because in some sense here, the coherence is imposed by the light. 
And many cases is a somewhat difficult to kind of distinguish. Can I see this one is both instant condensation of the exciton, or this is more like this laser, <laughs> right? That, uh, that boundary becomes a little blur. So this is kind of exciting directions, but it's somewhat different from what I just kind of mentioned. However, is it possible that I can just realize that this uh, exciton long, live long enough without the light or the uh, coherence drive? There's a yet different approaches we can learn from semi-kinetic heterostructures. Basically, can I just make the, this external live very long? The way is, oh well, well, so we can just separate the electron hole, not leaving the same place, such that their overlap becomes small. So make the, this, uh, the external live long. So in this example, there you can make the, this double quantum well, right? And create the external one of the, this quantum well. And if you bias this quantum well, you can quickly separate the electron hole into the living the different quantum well. However, they are still kind of very close by in terms of the distances because it's a kind of well structures, right? Therefore, although they are physically separated in the different well, their distance uh, is uh, relatively small, something like the nanometer, tens of nanometer length scale. So they are still kind of strong Coulomb interactions between them. Indeed, this type of this structure is what we call the interlayer exciton. Right, indirect text, spatially indirect text on interlay text. This has been pushed into the Gallimard and the heterostructures, um, and there has been beautiful work has been done. That indeed, if you just create those kind of interlay axonic system, put enough interlay axon, they start kind of behave like the spontaneous coherence start to build up, and some of the coherence uh, related with the interference pattern appears, strongly indicating at least the first step getting toward of this axon condensation is realized in this type of system. However, despite that this many, a lot of heroic efforts, it's still kind of a little bit difficult to deal with because in generally, this semiconductor heterostructures, uh, they're strong, the Coulomb uh, screening due to the, the relative high dielectric system, the external energy is a relatively small, something like the kind of milli-electric fold. An external lifetime is something like 100 nanoseconds. It's a probably 1,000 times longer than uh, direct exciton. But nevertheless, there are some of the fight we have to go through to really realize, stabilize this into the phase diagram. Now, here comes that uh, the 2D van der Waals system as a kind of interesting new speed. Because van der Waals system comes with a very different flavor. If you just focus on a semiconductor, there are transition metal dichocogenide with a different gap and different work function. So in principle, you can just choose on whatever heterostructure you want and you just put them together and they naturally align into the, the preferential quantum well structures such that once you generate this uh, excitons one of the system, they can in principle quickly uh, the break into the so-called interlay excitons that electron and hole living in the different layers, right? So with this type of the idea, the community has been pushing that idea to create this, uh, the interlayer, intralayer exton, uh, converting to interlayer extons quite a bit. The particular system that uh, my group have been working on, on this uh, at the frontier is a molydiselenide and tungsten diselenide. And uh, this materials now, they come with a reasonably high quality and molydiselenide is N-type semiconductor, tungsten diselenide is P-type semiconductor. We can just uh, stick them together, make the devices. And then on the top of that, we have to put this, all the gate structures to control the order density. A more important part is we can separate, separate contact, this uh, two layer with the electrical contact. And then of course, this contact needs to be also contact gated and those kind of things. So in some sense, we can create this atomically thin PN junctions as electronic devices. But in terms of the optical devices, that you have basically look at the spectrum of this, uh, the uh, optical spectrum, the, uh, the emission, emission spectrum by the photoluminescent. Uh, you can see that there are many sharp lines up here and it, at least we can see that there's a high quality of the external forms. More important part is there are high energy, the, uh, this peak appears in the, each of the individual layer region, tungsten diselenide and molydiselenide. And this is only the heterostructure region. So those kind of thingy, those kind of the, uh, the peaks in the, uh, the individual layer is related with the interlayer, intralayer extons. But in heterostructural region, basically you can quickly see the dominant, this interlayer exton peaks, right? So at least we know that in heterostructures, uh, there is a high likely chance that interlayer exton forms. And moreover, this interlayer exton 
can be controlled by the gate voltages, right? Because we just put the top and bottom gates and that's basically uh, form like the, applying the electric field. Interlay exciton is out of plane directions. So their dipole moment is out of plane, which can directly couple with the electric field that I can apply by just putting the opposite voltages in top and bottom layer. Therefore, that I can see that this interlay extend the, the photoluminescent peak energy is linearly shifted when I change electric field by controlling the gate. This is nothing but the linear stock shift. And from there, I can uh, just uh, the back calculate it. What is uh, the uh, dipole moment interlay action? Is it exactly match with this layer separation? That's good. But more exciting part is their lifetime. Their lifetime is, uh, first of all, something like the 200 nanoseconds starting with. It's not bad. But when I just kind of apply the more of the electric field, such the electron hole separation becomes a little bit longer, uh, the more then this lifetime quickly extended quite a bit, so high, half microseconds, even approaching the micro seconds of the lifetime is possible. It's at least 10,000 times longer, long lived compared with the typical exciton to the system. Such a long lived exciton is a first the ingredient we need to step forward to realizing the, uh, the exciton condensations. Hello, can I have a question? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so you 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 can use a von test to convert from uh, inter to intra uh, exciton, but I think that could you also change the uh, inter to uh, inter to intra by changing the distance between layer. Yes, indeed. Yes. So that uh, that, uh, that that is possible. So you can just can put the different separation layer. Uh, you can just do that, or you can even just kind of engineer this uh, the stacking um, uh, the uh, the band alignment, in principle, you can just change this intra to the intra, intra to the inter, and those kinds of things in principle possible, right? Here that we just have the type two alignments, so it's a, a very natural that any interlay extent quickly convert into the, uh, any interlay extent quickly turn into the interlay extent. Here that I'm interested in interlay extent, that's why that in a sense that that was the right choice from the beginning. And so when you do the von test, can you see the, the, the position that the von test, the, I mean, the, the, the value of the von test that you see the inter to intra uh, can match with the uh, theory? The, I mean, when you, can you see that the, the energy gap? Uh, in not in this one, but I think, uh, so you can also see that this um, interlay extent gap, I, by, by the way, this is absorptions. And then where you see that uh, only the gap or basically the, you can see the excitation of the intralayer extant. So this is a moly disilena intralayer extant. This is tungsten disilena intralayer extant. They are not changing too much because their gap is fixed, but intralayer extant, the, 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 the energy separation can be tuned by the gate voltages, right? So okay. here that the tuning is only done into the interlayer extant part, right? Okay, thank you. Right, this extant is a long lived Therefore, the once you excited the axon, axon tend to kind of diffuse quite kind of far from the where, we, where, where it's actually born. So that's actually good things. In principle, we can just think about the axon circuits out of it. But our interest is, can I just increase the, the axon density? One way you can increase the axon density is, of course, the excited more of this axon by the, the increasing the power of the lasers of the excitation. And indeed, when we just shine the more powerful uh, the lasers in there, as we increase the laser power, that uh, exton peak becomes brighter, but then not only it becomes brighter, of course, the energy start kind of shifted. And in fact, this energy starts shifting to the, the higher energy, blue shifting. And this blue shift is important because remember that this is in layer exton where the dipole moment is all aligned. So if you just put a lot of them, this dipole start to repair each other, right? Same aligned, the, the aligned direction of the dipole start to repair. And yet that I'm just kind of trying to put a lot of them in the small space, therefore their energy start got increases. In fact, this blue shift is a way that uh, was not exact uh, estimation, but at least it's a good order of magnitude estimations that we can make the, this blue shift turn into the how much extra density we just in, introduce. So looking at this blue shift of this increasing laser power that we estimate the interlay exton, we can create is something like up to the 10 to the 11 exton per square centimeters. And that's actually going back to the phase diagram of the what is expected that if you have the this exton density and this uh, the formula at R, they computed a rather simple calculation 
what is the, this intellectual density that is expected is um, the Bose-Einstein condensation. In fact, this is 2D. So the Bose-Einstein condensation 2D is uh, must go through this um, costless Taoist transitions. According to the, their calculations, uh, with the 10 to the 11, we have about the two Kelvin that, that create this uh, Bose-Einstein condensations. An experiment is done by four Kelvin and five Kelvin. Furthermore, when you shine the lights, it tend to heat it up the axonic system. So we are still kind of far reaching goal to get to this axon condensation with this straightforward measurement. However, we learned the lesson here. That what is the important part is at least we can create the long labeled axon. And then next step is, can we actually create this high density of course, one way high density uh, exton is you can shine a lot of light, but we know that that's not a good way because it tend to heat up the system too much. So we want kind of say create the exciton by the laser excitation, but we want to drive them into the away from this where it was born, but just to kind of drive away and condense it and in some other location where it's cold, right? To make it cold. Well, this means basically what I need is a uh, the trap. So the trapping of the electron in the 2D system has been kind of a lot. I think the few examples I showed in the beginning is if I put the gate and you can just trap it, but that doesn't work here because exon is neutral. So by just putting the electrostatic gate, basically I cannot trap the exciton. However, intralayer exciton, the energy is sensitively depends on the electric field in the vertical field, right? That's basically a stock shift I just mentioned, right? So what you can do is, Instead of just the one gate, if you just put the two gates, top and bottom, so what gate control is a basic electric field rather than electric potentials, right? At the vertical electric field, I can create the excellent trap. So this is basically a device scheme that we just put the top and bottom gates and then uh, by supplying this electric field there, we can create the interlay exon energy down, or this is exaggeration that uh, cannot be uh, zero, but can be small. And then there, that should act like the trap. Indeed, this type of device we just created, this idea, simple idea seems to work. So here that we put this wire and that along this wire top and bottom, basically it's carefully matched. So this is basically trapped region, right? And if I just don't apply any electric field in this, uh, the wire gates uh, that across uh, this uh, spatial location, uh, this uh, pho uh, the photoluminescent intensity is basically telling you that uh, exciton is basically there, nothing changes. Now we just put the gate, all the outside is uh, lower and the while that is in, uh, in the trip regime is higher, but then you see that the exciton energy becomes lower outside, but you can see that there is some exciton still remains the high side, but not as uh, bright as the somewhere there, right? So it means that there is a kind of weak anti-trap type of behavior. It's not as strong as we wish, but at least with the loving eyes, you can see that now you see, right? What is the more important part is when I just turn this into a trap. So energy here is uh, basically uh, lower than outside. You start to see that there's a bright spot appears in that the lower than outside energy. So indeed the, the trap seems to work as a trap behavior, right? Spatial map indeed shows that when we make the traps, indeed there is an increase of the axon density in the trap region, right? So it immediately tells us that indeed this the creating the exciton, say shining the laser there, and trapping that extends in this uh, middle of the trap, that idea seems to work. Now, important part is when you just uh, trap it versus not trapping, do you see the differences in terms of the uh, exon behavior in there? And here, this I'm just uh, the comparing that this uh, when the trap is not activated versus activated, I just to show the, how their spectrum changes as you change the laser power that we are, uh, our laser irradiation is somewhere away from the trap. Uh, and then you start to see that, for example, non-trap, that there is an increase of the, this, um, the uh, a small blue shift of the, uh, the interlay extents and indicating that previously that I mentioned that is related with blue shift. But once the trap is there, then you start to see that the blue shift becomes even stronger, right? Clearly you can see that. Uh, that once trap is uh, deactivated, there are more tendency that uh, increasing high density is possible, right? And increase its energy more, meaning that I have the higher density. You can in fact, uh, just uh, uh, using this blue shift map out, how the intellect external density changes the trap voltages as you make the trap deeper and deeper, 
this uh, trap uh, density start to increase and show that indeed we can create this uh, relatively high density. Now look at the density. Density is about 10 times larger than what we can achieve before. It's something like the 10 to the 12 uh, range of the electrons. And that's where you start to be able to see that at least uh, getting into the, this, uh, the more degenerate limits of the, this X term that we can create in the system. Another thing you note that here is basically when we increase the density, you start to see that their peak width here that becomes broad, right? So I can just show that this line, right? And this broadening of the, this the peak is kind of interesting behavior. What I'm saying here is as I increase the density, basically I start to kind of broaden out this peak. Well, at least it tells me that it cannot be uh, those Einstein condensation where that I expect this uh, peak narrowing rather than broadening. So it's something, so different things going on. So what is really going on here? In fact, this, you can just see the phase diagram and get the sense. If my external temperature is low enough such that once it created while it's trapping, it's cooled down enough such that it can into low temperature. Of course, I can see the Bose-Einstein condensations, hopefully, right? However, if the external temperature is not low enough, yet then you start from this, uh, the classic exon gas that going through the degenerate exon gas and too much degeneration, and then instead of the, uh, the condensations in high temperature, why do you expect to see that external world just melt away? In other words, basically strong interactions of the electron and the hole or the charges there, basically screen out all the Coulomb interaction to form the external and then basically turn into electron or plasma. And this is what is not uh, transitions. And that's basically ex expected. In fact, this has been really uh, recently seen in the Xiaoyang Shu's group at the Columbia, very similar system that we studied. They just shine the lights and using this uh, the femtosecond measurement, uh, basically they start to see that when they create enough the number of the externs somewhere in the middle of 10 to the 12, exciton emission becomes broadened out. And this broadening is a related indeed kind of formation of not at the, uh, uh, transitions happening. So what we are seeing is indeed really hinted. But one thing different from this experiments that what is beautifully done at the Columbia from us is we create the exciton far away from the trap, right? So trap is not yet effective as a kind of cool down the exciton, but certainly it's a cool enough that we can just make the temperatures of the cases. So indeed, when we just changed our base temperatures at kind of trap temperature, we start to see that the more transition is happening in different location and different density. Therefore, in principle, that this density can be mapped it out in the, our trap experiments in there, right? But clearly, this is a still ongoing efforts, or despite the really hard efforts, we haven't really reached the mod, uh, the exon condensation yet in the real exciton. And you start to see that, that where the struggle comes from. Struggle is basically we have to create this exon by optical means, and it's a rather difficult to kind of cool down this exon once you just create it by this the optical excitation. But at this point, you should remember that when I just introduced this device, this device is not only optical device, but this is an electronic device. Electronically, since I have the contact on both the N and P layer, this is a PN junction, nothing more, right? Which means, in principle, I can just apply these voltages to inject electron holes. In other words, in terms of electronic languages, so this is a basically atomically thin diode, right? Surely enough that when we just apply the bias voltage across the, this van der Waals gap, uh, that throughout this, uh, the separate contact on uh, uh, the tungsten diacetyl and molydiacetyl, right? When you just put this right polarity, you get this huge current increases for the bias and reverse bias, which are again, that can be controlled by the gate voltages by just kind of changing the doping. What we have to interest, uh, what we are interested in is this forward bias region where we can now inject the electron hole by electrical means, right? And that's where that indeed I can put the enough number of the electron hole through the system. And then in the right condition, especially when junction is intrinsic, the light comes out from the junctions. Basically this becomes atomically thin light emitting diode, all right? Well, what is interesting part is if you just look at the, their spectrum, their spectrum is sharply uh, peaked at the interlayer external peaks, 
But not only that, the energy can be controlled by the gate voltage like the internal external. More important part is if you just pulse this bias and then look at this electroluminescent lifetime, their lifetime is comparable of 100 nanoseconds, which is very comparable to the optically measured interlayer uh, lifetime, which means that basically this unambiguously show that I can create the interlayer extons by electrical hole injections to the system. So that's kind of very exciting. While that we are working on this, however, we also heard that this field is really competitive and there is a very exciting story actually came out from uh, group at Corner led by Kim Thai Ma and Ji Shai. And what they worked on is actually even smarter than us. They knew that interaction actually do exist, but then they can make the lifetime easy really, really long by putting boron nitride insulating layer in between them. So basically separating this two layer further, right? And then they inject the electron holes by again, like this uh, we did, just putting this electrode in there, right? Such a, the electron hole injection through this type of tunneling devices, if you just put the bias in up, then eventually there's a tunneling can happen, right? And what they see that is when the tunneling happens, there's a light comes out from this device. Unfortunately, the light they come in out here is a little bit thicker layer they use, like the three or four layer boron nitride. So it's not the interlayer external light at the light, but it's coming from intralayer the, the lights. But nevertheless, what they see that is in there, the current characteristic in this type of tunneling device shows a really interesting cusp of behavior where this cusp in terms of the gate at uh, the appears a constant bias is exactly pointing out what is a gate voltage that balance the electron hole injection into the system. And when you just pointed out that exactly balance the electron hole injections, they start to see that light emission coming from this device is basically threshold behavior. It basically turn on so rather suddenly and huge kind of peaks appears in this device. And more exciting part is when they just look at this quantum statistics of the light coming out, they start to see that some intriguing the quantum statistics, basically the, the, the bunching of the light come start to hour, indicating there are some of the coherence may start kind of appears in this type of devices. I would say this is very hinted and very exciting. And moreover, this uh, happens at 150 Kelvin, not just kind of really low temperature. This is very exciting news. However, the evidence is still rather indirect because what they see that is not the coherence of this, the interlayer exciton emissions, but somehow it is converted to the intralayer trier. So these are somehow indicative. It's not clear that whether it's yet the smoking gun evidence of the exon condensation, but this gives us a lot of hint that where we can go, right? So basically the, the directions we can move on is somewhere in between that previous experiment I showed you with the PN junctions with the direct contact versus this uh, the large tunneling layer. If you control this interfacial layers thicknesses such that you have the right balance between that this uh, tunneling as well as a lifetime, there is a good balance that you can get this interlayer exciton emissions by just uh, the light emission which actually give us a right tool to just look at the quantum statistics of this, uh, the underlying extant uh, states, right? But at the same time, we can just kind of drive these things electrically. So that is basically directions. Now this is uh, the ongoing efforts at this point. We just put them together. Uh, the, uh, again, tungsten diselenide, moly diselenide with one layer of the boron nitride. And surely enough, they start to show this uh, tunneling current behavior with the sharp cusp. So we know that where we can just uh, tune uh, this, uh, the gate voltages to get this uh, balanced electron hole injections. And certainly one, on that point, we start to see the thresholding behavior of this interlayer current and the light emissions uh, turns on at that threshold. And now uh, we at least see that uh, this, uh, the light emission is strongly just uh, they dominate by the interlay axons. So that there's another step. The next step that we have to demonstrate is uh, it, uh, whether we have the real quantum statistics and the quantum coherence of this light emission without cavity. That is uh, some of the ongoing experiment that we are doing. Hopefully next time I visit Brown, I can tell you whether there is a coherence or not. <laughs> right. But you start to see that this has been kind of few years of the struggle that we had as well as a field. And part of the reason is where axon condensation is a very exciting system to realize. 
but at the same time, axon condensation in the real axon is tough because inherent axon is still transient particle. Although we can make it long lived, but it's not living forever. And that has been just real struggle we have. Now, but we know that what is answered, that if the axon condensated. And that's already has been shown in other system. And this other system is basically, again, quantum structures, but not with this uh, semiconductor gap or the by the light, uh, the excited exciton, but you can create extra like the structures using uh, the magnetic field across the Landau gap. And the idea is basically Landau gap forms and you can form this uh, electron hole in the half field Landau level, or partially field Landau level, can form this magnetic excitons. Uh, mathematically, it's exactly the same formula that you expect to see that the, uh, the exciton formations, uh, the wave function description is exactly the same, except that now this requires no light excitation. And this is basically form across a partially field Landau level. So exciton, or exon condensation is basically ground state properties. So in principle, you can just realize that. And it is basically, you can explore the phase diagram, right? Well, this idea in fact has been pushed again in the field for the, in the past 30 years or so. Especially that the beautiful series of the experiments done by uh, Jim Eisenstinger and Carl Tech show that not only you can form this magnetic exciton, by the transport, you can just prove that either you just made a drag experiment, the count flow experiments. You can basically show this type of the exciton can form and you can just detect their uh, evidences by just a transport measurement and that through the phase diagram. So this has been some of the kind of strong efforts in the semiconductor structures. Of course, you can copy very similar idea into the 2D system. Like this, uh, the previous example, we can simply just copy down same idea but immediately we gain that one of the uh, advantages, as I said, graphing quality is now as good as gallium arsenide. So it's not a problem. But now we can just put these materials very close by and insulating gap that we have, all the dielectric we are using here is much weaker dielectric than typical semiconductor heterostructures. So Coulomb interaction is stronger and you can put this two layer very close by. So all the energy scale is certainly much, much stronger. And this immediately allows us to do the same experiments, but in much more robust way. And why this is important? Because it is robust, we can actually work on larger energy scale or larger temperature ranges, larger density ranges. And that's basically what is recently done uh, in, uh, in the collaboration that Leo and the collaboration Corey's and few groups just kind of combine together and this efforts has been done. The idea is kind of simple. So if you have the, these two layers, right? And if I have this excellent condensation is happening, that if I send the current to one layer and return another layer, this is what we call the counter flow geometry, right? In this geometry, electron holes can move into the same directions. Basically electron one layer hole in the, the other layer move in the same directions to carry this counter flow current. And once this forms, it becomes super fluid, which means that in count flow geometry, there is no dissipation. In other words, if you measure the resistance in that geometry, you expect to see the zero resistance, like the superconductor, except it is count flow resistance, right? So we can use that as our experimental, the order parameter to demonstrate there's condensations. And then measuring that count flow resistance in wide range of the temperature and magnetic field, we can draw the what is a phase diagram of the, this exon condensation, and this is it, right? So I just showed there is a magnetic field and temperature in the sweep, and the dark blue color is a zero counter flow resistance, which actually indicating something is condensated. Dark red is basically non condensated, and you see that there is a, some condensation to the non condensation, the phase transitions, and there's an interesting dome shape appears, which actually mimic the dome that I showed you before, right? But more important part is if I just park that certain magnetic field and cut it through, this how this uh, the changes look like, right? There, the, the condensation to the non-condensation phase change is rather different. Especially if you go to the low magnetic field, that the transition is rather broad. In fact, if you just look at it a little bit carefully, this can be explained in terms of the more of this activating behavior. But if you go to the really high 
magnetic field, condensation is really sharply changing, right? I think uh, the finite count flow regions to drop to the zero count flow regions rather rapidly. What you see here is basically the count flow resistance, but if I just delete this count flow sign, they look like the superconducting transitions, right? Although this is analogy, indeed, if you just look at the detail of the analysis, precisely that's right. And this is more like the BCS type of the transitions. And here, the low magnetic field is more like the BC type of the transition is what is expected. And that actually makes the sense because here in the magnetic excitons, their density can be, con or distance between the magnetic excitons can be controlled by the magnetic length. And magnetic length is inversely proportional to the square root of the B, such as here that you have the very small magnetic length, which means that pairs of the distance between the exciton, magnetic exciton is close. Uh, here that uh, distance between magnetic exciton is uh, far away. So therefore, this one is more like the individual exciton condensation. Here is more like the weakly bound exciton condensations, which actually look like the BEC to the BCS type of the transition is happening. So this is a good example that indeed, that once we realize the real exciton condensations, what uh, exciting things we can explore here, right? All right, so I know that my time is really up. So let me just skip everything that uh, prepare that. Basically, you can hear that all this rest of story from the Leo. I just uh, delivered that story that from here on that uh, what is wonderful things that you can realize this in the not only uh, electrons, but you can realize between the composite fermions and all these ideas of the interesting things that you can hear from the Leo. So let me skip all these things. But I will just end with this slide. So this is a slide I actually carried around about five years ago or something that when uh, we are kind of footsteps of this exciting field of the Van der Waals set of structures and you see uh, exciting things comes around. Uh, my story has, been has not been changed in five years in the beginning and to end, <laughs> beginning and end. And then usually the idea is, oh, you look at this uh, graphene, boron nitride, molybdenum, and you see that that's a, uh, same stories, right? Oh, it's a P and N junctions, the superconductors, uh, the ferromagnets. And then if you just kind of put same law and make the combination, oh, you can see a lot of exciting different physics is there, right? And what you see here is uh, some of them actually five years ago already realized, some of them are not realized. But in the very beginning, the few slides I showed that we made some progress as well as a field. So as a field that a lot of these things already figured it out by the field. So you start to see that you can just uh, deplete the phase diagram quite fast. However, you can see that uh, this low end column set increases uh, almost daily. And then you don't have to make the two stacks. You can make the three stacks. I can set up another stacks uh, the beyond. So phase diagram becomes quite kind of uh, rapidly increased. But quite recently we realized it's not only just a different kind. Even if you use the same materials, if you just stack the how to stacks and how do you change the stack angle, basically you can get the yet different things. So what you see in this diagram is basically now you have a lot of the different system. You can quickly realize by just kind of stacking this system, which actually give us a new platform, new playground that uh, uh, scouting for the very exciting physics. And already I see the Leo started out and many of the, those kind of systems, new to, uh, the, uh, new uh, tools started out at the Brown. As Leo said, there are a lot of competition, a lot of people are doing, working on uh, things, but I'm not worrying about because in some sense, look at the, the phase space. There are a lot of things we can just kind of explore all together. And even if thousand group work in the world, probably we are not going to explore all this possibility and exciting uh, the physics behind of that. With that, let me thank the, uh, my group actually, uh, uh, that uh, allows to prepare the, all the, the contents I present today uh, and the funding agency. Thank you. Thank you, Philip, for the wonderful talk. Um, since, uh, so will we have time to take some questions if some of you have to leave, like, yeah, Sean. Um, uh, this um, uh, um, co uh, flow uh, geometry yeah. in the magnetic field. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering, um, in the magnetic field, the Lorentz force on the positive charge and the negative charge are not in the same direction. 
And then how do they keep the uh, together? That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a kind of excellent questions. What happened is basically it's already a whole effect is taking care of that, right? So the, this is, um, that's a, that it's an excellent questions. Uh, but the, what have, and the classically you can, you can, if you think about, first of all, this is a little bit of the, the simplified, the, uh, the, um, the pictures. And uh, especially if you go to the higher feeling, there's edge state, you have to quantum or edge state, you have to take account. So there's a bit of more things you have to, you have to uh, consider. But nevertheless, and the quick uh, intuitive answer is basically uh, already under the magnetic field, we have the hole effect. So there's a hole field in the, in the sideways. So it is not the zero hole field, but there is a finite hole field. So hole field will cancel out the Lorentz force, right? And the current is kind of flowing in the straight, right? So that's basically the way that I can answer, right? But um, exciton is a bound state, right? Yeah. So my, my, my real question is whether this bound state can remain bound when um, you have a magnetic field. That's a that's a yes. That's also a kind of very excellent question. So, uh, in some sense, that uh, the um, the if if they can be unbound, basically there is a kind of some of the this finite the whole drag effect appears in the system, and that is a good way you can also detect that when excitons start to unbound. Uh, so. Uh, the right conditions so we have this excellent condensation is basically <coughs> there is no unbounding force to just kind of to try to unbound the, this excitons there. And then if you just move away from this unbounding condition, then there is a, the, the basically the, the pairing force that appears in this uh, uh, the magnetic excitons at some point that, that will be strong enough then will eventually unbound. And then uh, from there that you can also get this idea about excellent binding energies. Right. Leo actually is a real expert of the, uh, this kind of developed this technique and using this whole drag effect to just uh, take a look at this, what is a bind, uh, the bounding energy, so bounding the strengths of the sex term. And that can be actually a very useful tool. In fact, mm -hmm. detect how strongly this, uh, the magnetic exon is bounded together. But I, I know if you look at the, the exon as a whole, it's charge neutral. Yes. But because they are physically separated in two different atomic layers, that's right. So then, uh, locally, they are separate, right? So then, in the magnetic field, then don't they have uh, a, a vortex in the upstairs and, and the anti vortex downstairs? Mm. So that's a um, that's a yet kind of separate uh, separate problem. So the uh, as a, as a, the electron hole, they are not, uh, they are still kind of the the bounded uh, the electron holes, and then uh, it's just a lambda level. As a ground state, there you don't have to worry about any vortex. But as a two D system, two D uh, uh, so as a two D condensated system, right? If you just kind of write down all the parameters, yeah, I, yeah. I know on the whole they are not charged, but in each layer is charged, right? Right. So. That precisely. So what 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 you have to do is now if I just create the excitation of the this condensation, it must actually comes as a kind of interesting vortex form, right? What is the nature of this vortex? And that's uh, the one of the uh, unanswered and not clearly answered. And uh, people claim that this vortex, that excitation of the condensations to create this vortex, is probably mm -hmm. form of so called the meron, which actually is vortex tied with a fraction of the charges there or that. Vortex charges of the half electron one, half electron down. Yeah. Right? So this this type of the idea, what is this topological excitation of this two D condensation state, is a really uh, interesting field. We have some ideas and some evidences, but exactly nail it down. The, what is the nature of the, this vortex and how the charge is distributed in the uh, the top and bottom surface? I think this is a. a I would say that we don't have a yet clear answer, but mm -hmm. a very exciting uh, the future study. To be made. Okay, in the earlier uh, uh, part of your talk, you showed a, a picture of a, a chromium layer, um, a chromium something, uh, uh, separated between two superconductors. Yes. Um, yeah. uh, do you see uh, condo resonances there mm -hmm. or, or no? Um, not that we see the condo resonances here. Um, the, 
Part of the reason is that this one is uh, the basically magnetic insulator. And there is no, uh, the, you, you assume that there basically within, within our transport window, there is no just uh, the occupiable, the, uh, this, the, uh, the magnetic sites in there, that's a, that's a part. So I think therefore the condo physics is uh, not relevant. Here that this, uh, the resonance uh, happens, basically it's the virtual transitions with high and low energies to make the, this, uh, the Cooper pair transform one side to the other. So that's uh, the, uh, the theory that we understand here because uh, this is a magnetic insulator. However, that if you just bring this at uh, the relative small gap magnetic insulator, or that if you just somehow gate it, that's such that one of this, uh, the empty or the field state of magnetic, uh, the polarized state is uh, within the energy scales of the, this uh, transport um, uh, 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 at the near the Fermi levels of the superconductor, mm -hmm. I think then indeed uh, this uh, is a very exciting system that one may actually mm -hmm. consider the kind of physics that related with this uh, transporting Cooper pair. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, we believe that that's not the regimes that we are working on. Good questions. So maybe we have time for one more question because Don raised his hand a long time ago. Okay, thank you for the very good, very good talk. I have uh, actually two questions. Yeah. One is naive. Uh, can you make a light trap, not just a local trap? Can you make a, a light trap so can you can like attract the exciton in in the one dimension system? Uh, all right, light trap. Light okay. trap, trap. I mean, you have a trap oh. with. Oh, uh, I see. A light trap. Okay. So okay. Yeah. Um, it's basically some ideas close by something like this, right? So I think uh, here that people make the this trap, so cavity, uh, yeah. just kind of the basically, I would say it's a one D cavity, but it's a vertical directions like this. So in principle, that we can just uh, do very similar thing. In fact, actually, there are people doing very similar directions. I think uh, Atachi Imamoglu groups at the ETH actually is somebody that putting this the, the heterostructures into the. Uh, this uh, distributed black meters to realize this uh, trapped or cavity light interacted with this exciton to create the exemplariton. So that's certainly kind of one of the interesting directions. Now, whether one can just create the, not only the vertical directions, but parallel directions and those kind of things where the light is uh, traveling in that directions, uh, that's challenging in terms of this uh, device path now, but uh, uh, one can imagine to think about uh, more of these axonic devices, including that quadrant light manipulation. Thank you. And uh, my uh, second question, maybe a stupid question, but uh, we know that Wigner and Mermin tell us that there's no long range order in two dimensions. Yeah. So how can we think about your BC of the exciton? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. Uh, very good question. Well, what I would say that is, um, yeah, um, uh, I think I, I think there's one one way to 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 escape this saying that in in terms of like by the quantum hole you have to excite on with the massless. Yeah, so the massless in two D can 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 condense, but you have the other system with not quantum hole. Then I yeah, yeah, that's right. To... Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I know that that's a that's a tough question. So I think, uh, but at the same time, people casually say to the. To the superconductors as well. Well, one way you can say that, that the true transition temperature is uh, not there, and it's always a uh, kind of uh, the uh, continuous uh, the phase transitions or something. Or the other way, the more 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 prudent way that I would say that is, anyway, as an experimentalist, we are always dealing with the finite size of sample. Uh, uh, Mormon Wagner theorem work and the really thermodynamic limits, and then size effect grow as a logarithmically. Right. I see. So get into the what uh, Mommy Morgan theorems are relevant. I may not need I may need a kilometer size of sample or 10 mile size of sample. While the, my sample is a 10 micron size of uh, uh, size, as long as the space quadrant length is the size of my sample, which is about 10 micron size, I can effectively think about this is a still kind of uh, the enough the long range orders the uh, set yeah. it up into the in the, the my sample size, and I effectively. Uh, call that is a 2D phase transitions. Although I think uh, I agree that indeed uh, the true phase uh, phase transition arguments you should do in the thermodynamic limits where the L goes the size of a universe, right? I see, thank you. Yeah. 
Okay, let's thank Philip again. Philip, thanks for the wonderful talk. And thank you so much, and it was it was very fun. Yeah, thank you. I enjoyed your talk, Philip. Thanks. Yeah, I yeah. will get back to you later. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Leo, then I have one question. So is all the foreign graduate students uh, that uh, came into the campus now or that uh, what is Brown's policy now? That do you have this year G0 that you, you, you bring the last semester that they all come to the, uh, on the campus or they are still stuck into, stuck into the foreign country? Are you asking about undergrad, grad students? No, graduate students. International? Yeah. Uh, if they so, I, I know that there are some international students who uh, who came on campus uh, as long as they have a visa and they're allowed to. I see. Then Brown doesn't have a. Uh, I don't think Brown has a limitation on that as long as they quarantine. I see. Uh, the Chinese students from China are delayed by a year. Uh -huh. Last time I heard. How about the students with without visa and that they need to get the visa, but is a visa easy to get now? Or I don't know. Yeah. For China? Yeah. No, no. In in, in China, it's a, a, it's basically kind of very difficult now. But right, that's right. Yeah. How about the other places? Yeah. Uh, some of them are able to get it. I see. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how, but uh, I know some from, for example, India are able to come. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Europe is probably easier, I assume. Yeah. 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 I don't know how exactly how this works. A lot of people stop traveling because yeah, it's actually still kind of quite messy, but hopefully the things becomes better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'll yeah. make sure you to rest a little bit before the next uh, meeting or so. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Great. Take care. See you later then. Bye now. Yes, later. Bye. Mm -hmm.